Right, good evening folks, it's from the home of Angus John McClellan, famous piper, and he's going to tell you uh, from the West Coast. I could never make up my mind whether it's Ross or South Uist, probably both. We'll sort it out later on, and uh, when we hear from Angus's family, uh, famous uh, family history and his piping and sources and everything else. So, uh, it's just for a record, it's uh, Wednesday, 27th of October 2010, and uh, we have Paul, the cameraman, with me this time, so we're going to do it right. And uh, we look forward to speaking to Angus and uh, all his little stories. Thank okay, Right, hey, Angus, uh, you're not known as Angus John, it's Angus Jai McClellan, uh, I don't know why, you'll explain that in a wee second. Uh, Angus, uh, what I'd like to start off with is uh, your family uh, background, where you were from, uh, and who your father was, and uh, your father uh, played pipes. Uh, sources of your piping, initial sources, when you started piping and who taught you, that sort of stuff, okay? Well, to begin with, Alan, I was lucky enough to be born into a piping family in a sense. My father, Donald, who came from South Uist, and he was a very good player having been taught by some of the local players. There are, first of all, a fellow uh, Campbell and another fellow Walker. And Willie, Willie Ross went out to the islands at that time. And amongst the sort of contemporaries was people like John MacDonald and Roddy MacDonald and the Macmillan family, all good players. Mm -hmm. And But eventually I moved to the Isle of Butte, to Rossi, and uh, we, when I was brought up there, and the, the, of course the war was on, and then the, a lot of the military people came there. But slightly after the war, they all came back, and it was amazing the amount of people who returned interested in the pipes. And no long after the war, at one time, there was three different pipe bands in Rossi. There was the Rossi Pipe Band, uh -huh. who at that time was led by a fellow called Archie Martin, Kilty Martin, you might. And the Bannatyne Stewart Pipe Band, which was started by a fellow called John Stewart, uh, or Peter Stewart, sorry, Peter Stewart. And then um, there was... Um, the uh, juvenile pipe band, and uh, but, but I said with all these people, I was lucky enough to get input from every one of them, helped along the way in showing various things. But mm -hmm. basically, my basic teaching was from my father. What age were you? Well, I was when only about, well, I was only about five, four, right. five, six when I started. Uh -huh. I I remember playing in a school concert when I was in the first year of the primary school. <laughs> Good. Ah, yes. Aye. Excellent. Although so, I don't recommend that, Alan, because no. sometimes by the time you're 10 and 12, you've had enough. And Aye, well, but it, it just, d d what, what age do you like to start them off if you're teaching? Depends on, again, it depends on the individual, but I would suggest somewhere around 9, 8 to 9. Aye, I thought so. Uh, yeah. At that time, they're getting a wee bit of understanding. and It's the concentration levels that's as well, a, That it? is a big problem. Yeah. But uh, I hate to force them, Dave. I wouldn't force oh, them. Aye. And, uh, of course, everybody's different. And oh, aye. And some folk uh, start early and, and they are successful, and the other ones have got to wait until the brain... Uh, well, Life was up about 11 or 12. Well, or I had a pupil for a long number of years, a fellow called Stuart Gordon. And this was uh, later on in life. And at the beginning, Stuart was a bit of a nightmare. Oh, he just... Two, for two years, and if it hadn't been for the, his father and his mother and it had been such a wonderful family, I would have thrown him out the door. Aye, aye. But he, he persevered and he became a very, very good player. Excellent. An excellent player. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just fell into place. So who who else taught you then after your father? After my father, well, I went away to sea when I... Well, between my father and Alec McIntyre, and, and then I... And I used to get tape lessons from Donald McLeod. He was at that time at Fort George. Okay. So we got the lessons by tape from him. Is that reel-to-reel -reel tape? Reel-to-reel -reel tapes. I've still got them to this day. Wonderful. I, yeah. I, and he was a particularly great uh, teacher, uh -huh. at least I thought so. Yes. I first met him in in South Uist in 1952. I was home there 
that uh, during the summer as holidays and we were at the games and I could hear this plane coming out of a sand dune and all I could see was a wee top of a Glengarry and this drone, big drone sticking out. And there was this wee man, uh -huh. very tiny as you know, uh -huh. and a BD jacket buttoned up playing the tune and I didn't know what it was at that time. It was the Hens March to the Midden, uh -huh. which he had no lo not long since composed. So I was going over and I spoke and I says, excuse me, sir, what was the name of that tune? Uh, and he, oh, he says, it's a wee thing I put together, it's the Hens March. Is it in a book? Do you know where I can get it? No, 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 he says. Uh, <laughs> no, he says, but I'll tell you what, if you give me your uh, details, I'll send it to you. What's your name? Uh -huh. And I says, Angus McClellan. He says, are you Donald's son? I says, oh, goodness sake. However, to cut a long story short, true to his word, Within three weeks, I had a, that copy of that tune, and it's still there today in this book. That's it. You've got the book there. Uh, just uh, wave was, it up to the camera. Just well, this, this kind of book I've kept of certain things. Book, aye, aye. Aye. So there you That's, are. Aye, all the handwritten tunes in aye, it. I never... And even when I put them into a proper manuscript, I wouldn't get rid of them. <laughs> That's a great value. Aye, aye. Now, we've started on a Donald MacLeod. I think we'll just continue with Donald well, for it, a wee it, minute. It, you know. and, and when I, when and I you mentioned to... your father, uh, and, and uh, Donald knew your father. Oh, very well, well very and much so, yeah. What was the connection there? You well, know? you know, coming from the Isles, and the, they met at various places. and uh -huh. The piping, really, the piping. Yeah. Um, but I went away to sea then. Uh, before, I, 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 sorry to interrupt you, you tell me the story about the 2 4 march and your, your father, uh, the, the Donald well, composed. If, if you just, I went away to see Alan, and when I came back to, to uh, Glasgow, and I went to see about 52 or something, uh -huh. and I came back about 60, before 61, 62, okay. and that's when I joined the, the, the Glasgow police. Right. Angus MacDonald was rebuilding a new band there and I was lucky enough to get in. And uh, Donald MacLeod came out of the army and he became the manager in Granger and Campbell. Campbell. In Argyle Street, 1103 Argyle Street. And, uh -huh. and uh, so I started going there and we went to the shop and we went to the house for lessons and I had a great time. Anyway, he, did you see the composing side of it? He often said to me that, that was a separate gift, mm -hmm. and so it is. Gifts, composing is another gift. He, Donald was lucky to there are sort of four gifts in piping. One is the playing, the teaching, the composing, and these, uh, what was the other one? The blowing. The the blowing the, and he had every one of them. Not, right. Many people have two to three, but he right. had every one of them. He was right. a, it was a separate gift. So, to get back to the point, I was down in the house in 44 Cardinal Gardens having uh -huh. the usual lesson there, and we were sitting by the fireside and they played this tune through and he says, what do you think of this? I says, oh, that's absolutely terrific. I says, well, what were you going? Well, he says, I was going to call it after your father because uh, I haven't made one for him for a, and we've been friends for a long time. Oh, I says, he'll be delighted. So I, there and then, he got the tune and they wrote it out, and here it's in this book here. You've got the original, the original copy. original copy, dated and everything. And, and what was it called? It wasn't called anything at that time. Right, aye, but, but it, uh, what was it eventually called then? Oh, Donald McClellan of Rossi. Donald McClellan of Rossi. Donald McClellan of Rossi. And the, how should it be played? Well, to me, in a, in a, 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 a more simpler, I, I, wouldn't, I don't like to hear it rushed. Something like pulling out all the music and all the, yeah. the, the cinema because the doll was full of music. But and I got said there was another wee feature about that particular tune. Well, the third part he changed the, when it went to print. Uh huh. He changed it. And the other wee thing, of course, it was the first time they come across a tune where you got a turla from C to B. Yeah, coming yeah. From, uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. uh, I think there'll be plenty of these things nowadays, but, aye, aye, but, but it's I an remember, innovation. Eh? I remember getting the tune from Donald and learning it. And I was to say I was in the police, and Hannah and I, my wife Hannah and I, we went down to Rossi for a wee weekend. Uh -huh. And of course, when you got to the house, you were welcomed in, but you were allowed five minutes. Well, I was only allowed five minutes from my mother. Have you got the pipes? <laughs> you say, yeah. 
So I threw to the room and get the pipes out. I thought, I'll get you this time. Aye. And he's sitting there smoking away. I got the pipes going and I played this down on my clay on the brass here. And he's he looking at me. What was that, he says. <laughs> I says, that's a... I won't know what was that rubbish, he says. What was that? <laughs> I says, that's a new tune Donald's composed. And uh, what does he call that, he says. Well, he was thinking of calling it after yourself. But if you don't like it, I'll go back and tell him. Let me hear it again, he says. <laughs> and of course, when I played it, they say, that's a good tune. That you tell, <laughs> tell John you can name that. <laughs> and it's a very popular uh, competing tune. It became tune. a very popular tune. I think it's kind of dying off a wee bit at the moment. Ah, but, but they had a good run. The, oh, it's had a great run now. Ah. But you know, he made another one not long after that. That was 65 he made that, I think. And in 68 he made one called the Glasgow Sky Centenary Gathering, mm -hmm. which to me is just an excellent tune as well. And you never hear that, eh? Well, I've one or twice you hear Willie McCallum plays it. Uh -huh. Quite a bit. He even won the Donald McLeod okay. mm -hmm. competition, but a great, good tune it was. Aye. And while we're on about Donald McLeod, uh, in the army, he was in the army. I'd tell the people where he was and what he did there. Well, he was in the Seaforth Islanders. He joined the Seaforth Islanders as a young man, and he, of course it was during the war, and he came through the ranks very, very quickly. And as I understand it, he was one of the youngest pipe majors in the army at the time. And he went to France and escaped from France and got his way back. And then he did, he was with the Seaforth Highlanders a lot in Fort George and the Brigade Dawn and places that Brigade mm -hmm. teaching. Yeah. Uh, a very, very popular soldier. Yeah. Um, and uh, have you got any idea how many tunes he composed in his lifetime? No, no. I've tried to take, but the tunes that I've, you know, I've even got a list of them here. He would say, oh, that's rubbish. And he'd throw it in a waste paper basket and I would rescue it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so there were tunes um, and tunes. Tunes eh? and joy. Oh, there was tunes. Some of them, of course, some of them he knew. Yeah. And you take the likes of Susan McLeod, he knew that was going to be a winner. Right. But strangely, he never made an awful lot of good stress bays. Never did anybody else, if the truth be told. No, that's true. The stress bays yeah. are the most difficult. There's a dearth uh, there, isn't there? Aye. Uh, uh, yet, uh, and unusually, he composed a lot of good Pembroke's, didn't he? He, ca he, got a, he has a book, book out, I think, about 20-odd. I think if I can remember rightly, he composed about 34 or 35 Peabrooks to sell, all in the simple idiom, yes. uh, the Peabrook idiom, uh, and not, uh, you know, shortage if you like, yeah. uh, but very, very musical, yeah. and the descriptive. Uh, and would you like to tell the people about the memorial competition story? Well, think? after that, after he died, um, the, the British, the Scottish, uh, what do you call them, the Piping Association in Stornoway there, led by Ying Morrison uh, and the committee set up this competition uh, in memory of Donald and it's gone, never, I think it's gone about 20 odd years now and it's like you have to play um, all his, com well not all his compositions, in the Peabrook you play one of his of his Peabrooks and in the March to Spain Reel you play a March and a to Spain Reel of his composition and then you play a March to Spain Reel well, other choice. And that's a difficult thing is matching them together. Yeah. Uh, but it just goes to show you the music is. And the uh, Hornpipe and Jig? Hornpipe and Jig was more or less started off as a fun thing. It doesn't come into the overall thing, but that's where he was at his greatest, of course, in composing all these tunes. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah. And so that was a Donald with his composing yeah. and a, his teaching. Could you mention something? Well, no, I found them because right away. Let me say I'm very, very biased with this, uh -huh. naturally. But I found his teaching excellent. He got his point across and he showed you exactly what he wanted. And the good thing about it, as you well know, Alan, Peabrook has what they call different settings and different styles. Now, Donald would teach you the tune, the way he played it, or the way he was taught himself. Generally known as a McPherson style, although I'm not too sure if that's 100% accurate. But then he would show you later on, he would show you the other ways and to be able to appreciate what yes. and, and the good points of them as well. Uh -huh. And he was not adverse to playing that as well uh -huh. and, and doing these things. Yep. 
Um, but he had a great knack of um, getting things across to you. I can always remember learning the MacLeod of Rassi's salute. And uh, I usually find a wee bit difficult to satisfy uh, him with the opening phrase. Uh, well, not so much the opening phrase, but a phrase in it. And I remember one night he says to me, do you know I'm called Lachie? He says, of course you do, I do, you know. Well, he says, but Lachie, and it came, and it just fell right into place, you know. That's terrific. Um, That's great. That's a good story, that There was one. another one, too. It was a tune that was set for the medal one year, and oh, sometimes when these medal tunes come out, we were all, oh, what's this? And I was just as guilty as a lot of times. And this year I went, went down to see him in the house, and... He said about this, um, what's your free picture list? I said, well, I've had a look at them. I think what about this, uh, all the old men paid rent, but Rory, that's no much of a tune. Oh, no, no, he says, don't be too hasty. And the Gaelic title was Pine and Bottich, Malach Ruari. And he sang the first line to make that fit. Pine and Bottich, Malach Ruari. And it just fell right in. God, I, I could have crawled under the carpet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, excellent, man. Now, uh, spoken about that, but it, is a, it would be worthy of mention how prolific a prize winner he was in his heyday. As far as I'm aware, he won everything. There were certain prizes not available. He didn't win, for example, a silver chanter, but it wasn't around in his competing mm -hmm. time. And, uh, but and, he, you know, he, Win both medals, Your obviously. The grants competition wasn't there either. No, that, that wasn't sort of there. No, there. no, Later just additions the, to the. No, it didn't start till about seventy four. And it was a it. brief mention on Grange and Campbell bagpipes well, and chanters. When he came out of the army in, I think it was sixty two, sixty three, he took up the position as manager in the shop there, uh -huh. and that was where he was sort of he revolutionised the, the bagpipes there and did a great deal for that firm. Yeah. Um, how and did course, you find the instrument that uh, uh, you know that they made uh, well, under Donald? I was a bit of a traditionalist, Alan, and, and I was fortunate enough to inherit my father's Henderson bagpipes. Yeah, uh, and I was kind of reluctant. To, I he gave me a set one year uh, that was made specially for a customer. And I took them around the games, and they were very, very good. Uh, but I, there was something I just didn't you know. <laughs> I, I, uh, know. I, I remember the band had them, the chanters for a year. Yeah. And they really weren't a success. That was around about 65, if I remember correctly. I think, uh, slightly uh, about, something about that. It now. was about 65. Uh, we switched to the Hardy chanters shortly thereafter. 67, after. I guess, we switched yeah, to the Hardy chanters. I think so. Um, so that's uh, Donald. And you mentioned uh, the chap McIntyre. Um, I think it, another sentence in uh, McIntyre because he went on to meet Reeds and he stayed at Tower Point. Alec, Alec McIntyre came from Isla. He was a very, very good player. Man. Uh -huh. He was the first pipe major of the Athenia pipe band that sailed in the ships okay. out of Greenup before the war. And then he was a pipe major of the Royal Naval Torpedo Factory pipe band in Greenock. Uh -huh. And he, as, you, as you said, he went into reed making and he started in Greenock. And strangely enough, he moved to Butte for quite a while. He was pipe major of the Manatown Stuart pipe band there, and he uh, made reeds there. Then eventually he moved over to Tower, to a lovely wee place, Aye. and continued the reed making. Another uh, He wee... was a very, very musical man too, Aye. and very good with the bagpipe. Was he? Oh, very good at setting up a bagpipe. Aye. A great friend of a fella called John Blacks from Tyne uh -huh. They used to be together quite a bit. There they are. Mm. Another wee cameo about you at sea. You were um, at sea. Tell uh, people f what sort of uh, a seaman you were and where you went and well, I was the all experiences piping. At, yeah, at I was sea. lucky enough to be go all over the world, Alan, and mostly Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And during that time, the late the fifties and into the early sixties, I met a lot of the uh, great pipers especially in Canada, mm -hmm. and that's when I first got to know people like um, uh, Lewis Turtle in New Zealand and uh, and all these, and they were young men, of course, and New Zealand was a very strong point of 
piping still is, as far as I'm led to believe. Yes. And Vancouver was a great day, a great place. But the trouble with Canada is you had the established sides that are in Vancouver or the West Coast and then Toronto, and it was such a distance apart. Right. The, 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 but I can, I can remember then, even around, when we, I was on a, a ship called the Colina, and we went, we were the first to go up the Great Lakes, sailed up the St. Lawrence having to, and went right the whole way up to the, the end of the lakes there. And Thunder Bay it was at that time, I think it was called. And uh, on that way up, I met Pipers in every place. You, you couldn't uh, uh, go anywhere without meeting them. Amazing, yeah? Oh, it was terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, people well, like John Wilson. quite a good Wilson. player at that time. Oh, aye, aye. Uh -huh. I was enough, I mean, I, I met John Wilson and, and, you know, he moved from Edinburgh to there. And yes. Archie Cairns and uh, some of the, there's other great players, I just can't remember all their names now. But some guys that we they were terrific players, you know, and Aye. their one downfall, if you could say that, was maybe the bagpipe. Aye. Just wasn't quite what the... Because they wouldn't be hearing. They weren't them. hearing it, but they weren't also getting the, the best there is. Aye. But that soon changed. Of course it did. Mm. And we'll come on to that later on. Uh, you left uh, the Merchant Navy. Left the Merchant Navy and joined, it. as I said, I was lucky enough to be invited to join the Glasgow Police in 1962. And I'll never forget, we went to the, it was called the Pierce Institute in... Govan. Govan. Yeah. And that was an addition. And good. when I looked around, there was Roddy MacDonald and um, uh, Angus MacDonald and uh, Angus Morrison and John Johnson and John, John Johnson, Garraway. Right. And this Angus brought me and said, now, this uh, fellow who's we hope will join us, he'll just give us a wee tune now. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> of course, I played in the right shoulder. But, oh, Roddy was there. He saw Roddy played in the right shoulder. Aye. Well, I got Roddy's pipes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I played, oh, and it was pretty well accepted. Oh, that's great. But uh, I must say, all the time I was in the, both the Glasgow Police uh -huh. and uh, the uh, Strathclyde. Strathclyde Police, uh -huh. I learned an awful lot from the present members and the ex new members from big Ronald Laurie. Ronald was a gentleman. Yes. And he was a great... A teacher to me. When he became the pipe major, he was good. And Ian McClellan, what what uh, that man doesn't know about tones, no worth knowing. Uh, he so was another. But there was other guys in the band, you know, who had their own individual wee touches, and you could hear mm -hmm. where they came from. Aye. And, uh, good, good players they were. Uh, Aye, terrific. What about Angus MacDonald? Uh, how did you fare with Angus as a pipe Well, Angus was a, Angus was a difficult man to get on with, as you well know. Aye, aye. But I, I got on all right with him eventually. But uh -huh. the thing was, you, he was like some other people. You, you just had to fight back at him too. Oh, <laughs> but he was a good player, you know. Good player. He was a good he always player. did a good bagpipe, aye, didn't aye, he? Aye, he did. He had a Robertson never, set. Never had a bad bagpipe. He had a pipe. Robertson set of bagpipes and he went and ruined it. He, they got into this, be in their heads about changing the middle joints and and Aye. the bass throwing and if they'd left it at one but he changed the middle and it top and it, the bagpipe I don't think was ever Ronnie was an awful guy for that wasn't he? Aye but Ronnie did it he, it was the bottom joint It was the bottom joint he did he uh, to the tenor drone a, a uh, diameter wasn't it? But Ronnie was um, Ronnie knew what he was doing Aye. Aye. and of course he was working with Bob Hardy then uh, right. uh, getting all these things uh -huh. but Ronnie, Ronnie was a gentleman a, a real Ronnie and his family they were terrific people to meet. And the Glasgow Police Pipe Band were very successful in the 60s. In the, eventually in the 60s, Ronald uh, took over and we never quite got to the, that. I think if I, remember, I think you were there yourself, Alan. Aye. It was one year we had played in 14 competitions and we got 13 firsts. Aye. And the one we got second in was the Worlds, of the course. The Worlds beat a tenth of a point. Aye, by... 1966, Inver Inverness. Inverness. And who was judging? Well, one of the judges was, was my <laughs> my friend Seamus. <laughs> I think he was doing the ensemble. I think that was the start of the ensemble. Aye, aye. And he gave us fifth or something else. Oh, and, bad man. Uh, <laughs> bad man. <laughs> <laughs> but and, on you. Yeah, Muirhead's a uh, beat us that year. Muirhead's were a great And band. the beat us the following year, it was uh, a more respectable quarter point we get beat by. Uh, the, was that in Forfar, was it? I think it was uh, I think it was Oban. 
Ah, it's Oban or Forth. Oban, and uh, that was the time that oh, uh, Ronnie played right down the street after single, it, single file, file, like the Apaches. <laughs> oh, I, we were, there was a big uh, hold-up of traffic and the band were trying to get down and, and Ronnie decided, right, we are just going into single file right down the pavement the whole way down. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, playing. I was quite a character, Ronnie, wasn't he? Yeah, well, he, was a, he was a great guy. A great there. player at that time. I liked Ronnie, especially as a March player. Aye. Um, he, he was a very good Peebrook player, of course, and he Aye. won the gold medal playing McDougall's Gathering. Oh, but he, what a wonderful job he made of that tune. But he wouldn't, he wouldn't learn a lot of tunes for some Aye. reason. Aye. Just was found it time-consuming. Aye. There's a few people like that, you know. But the Spain real player, the, the reels I remember, very free-flowing when he played himself. I just did thundered you ever, right through. Did you ever hear him playing Loch Hills away to France? No. As a real... Well, <laughs> his father, uh, old Angus Laurie, Aye. was a great man on the trump, you know, playing the, the, the trump. And one of his favourite things was this uh, Loch Hills away to France. And Big Ronnie took the setting from that, the way he played it, and that's and he was very excellent at it. Aye. Uh, he was good. Good guy, Ronnie. Uh, I liked Ronnie. And I, I like, uh, there's a lot of good chaps in the band at that time, too. Yeah. Aye. At, uh, what was it, your, your favourite sort of Peebrooks that you were going through with Donald while all this was going on? Well, you were set until, you know, you were kind of held back with what they called the, the set tunes for the gold medals. Uh -huh. And some of them I, I learned, but I would, I would never play again. Uh -huh. But I'd, I must say, I, I had a, I liked things like the Meant for Donald Dougal Mackay and the children, Meant for the children, Scarce of Fishing, and Earl of Antrim. I liked these long, musical, melodious tunes. I think the last time I had a conversation with you, we discussed briefly Scarce of Fishing. Well, the scares of fishing, of course, uh, uh, there's sort of two ways to introduce that, and I never really, I, I played it the way that I was taught by Donald, and that was the long F to begin. And I But others played that short. Emphasis in the sea. But the strange thing is when you, the, the first way I sang it there, which was taught by the, in the McPherson style, if you want to call it that, they played the the ground, as I said, they didn't play the doubling of the ground. And then they came on to the first variation and they brought it down then. And I, was that successful uh, yes. to the, with the judges? Uh, yes, how did the judges view so that? They accepted it. They came from John McDonnell, I understand. Uh -huh. okay. You see, the thing was, I remember some tunes you would get. Uh, if a tune had a Turla Breipach, you know, or whatever, and then the croon will be oh, and I used to say to Tom, why did they play one one? And he says, well, thinking the name's a variation, and that's it was a simple I answer. Suppose, yeah, of course, so, I, that's uh, right. You went on to compete in solo competitions. Um, when did you start competing seriously? I would say about 65 when uh, uh, Ian McClellan, I, if I remember correctly, one of the first games we attended was a place called Earth, uh -huh. through in Stirlingshire, and we went through there and we got two thirds each. I think I got third, and Mr. Spear and Neil and Ian got third in the mat, and we thought we were the greatest things. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Ian had an old car at that time, and how we made it there and back. But that was the start of it, and then we... Started moving around, and the, but we, did, we were curtailed. Did you, have to, did you have to get your name in? With Unfortunately, the well, uh, so you have your uh, apprenticeship. It was kind of like that, but but uh, to be honest, you, know, there were some good players around. People like Archie McPhail and uh, all these, uh, you know, all Hugh McCallum, Ian McFadge, and uh, Ronald. Uh, what do you call him? Um, John McDougall. They were all good, good players, you know. Yeah. 
And when you got a prize, you were doing very well. Jimmy King was playing about that time as well, wasn't it? Don't remember. The, Jimmy King was a drummer with a dizer. No, I'm thinking, what's it? Jim, hey, King, what was his first name? Joe King. Hi. Joe, Joe, no, Joe wasn't, I, I don't remember Joe competing. So no, Joe, no, I'm thinking of another King entirely, the wee blonde uh, hair chap. Can't remember any of that, but you could have, I'm not saying. Nah, but we'll move Doogie on. Ferguson, of course, was. Oh. Um, He's uh, a quite uh, unassuming chap, uh, Doogie, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he was a character as our Doogie. A nice fellow, Doogie, though. Uh, oh, God, he was a character. He worked with Granger and Camels as well. He was a fireman, and uh, uh, when he was in his days off, he would go and tie in bags and parcel up things and do that. Oh. But he was a good player. Aye. I played with him in the hackle. Aye, with Donald Murray. Aye. Uh, and so there was quite a um, gathering of people there at that time. Tell us about your uh, the medal well, and, and the pipe that you played and the chanter that you played. Well, I started going to the medal and in the beginning, of course, I wasn't doing too well. And, but I, I remember I played, a, I think it was about 70, 69 or 70, and I played a tune called um, Mrs. Smith's Salute, mm -hmm. which was really unheard of. And uh, the report, Archie Kenneth wrote a piping, uh, an article in the Piping Times, and he said, although a little bit in inaccurate, I certainly knew how to phrase it, and that encouraged me. And so I went on in a 1972, Hugh McCallum won the medal, uh, and I was second, and that really boosted me up. And again, so I was lucky in 73 to win the medal, with uh, Glenn Gary's March. And I remember going back to Donald and he says, well, if you can do it once, you can do it twice. What and, instrument did you play? Well, I had my father's bagpipe then. It was a Henderson bagpipe, sort of plain silver slides and mm -hmm. nickel. Uh, he, he bought it, or his father bought it, in 1902. And I've still got the receipt for it Great. <laughs> to this day. And... Uh, it was cost two pound twelve. My goodness, two pound twelve shillings, and uh, that bagpipe's still here. Yeah, I'm trusting it'll go on to my grandson, but not by any force. Uh, Just. Uh, but uh, then, of course, when I started, I had a, another set of bagpipes. I had a centre set of bagpipes, mm -hmm. and they were very, very good. Mm -hmm. I got them from a fella in Rossi. Uh, what was his name again? He went to America. Workman? Aye, and no, it wasn't that. No, Hammy came from Greenock, Hammy Workman. Oh, gosh, what was that fellow's name? Uh, anyway, he stayed, I can see the house he's still playing. And we got, my, grand, my grandfather and my mother's side bought them for me. Good. Uh, and we had a, at well, that time there was a wee bit of a battle, 51, 52, between Robertsons of Edinburgh and Hardy. Mm-hmm. And I personally liked the Robertson chanter, Aye. and I played it. But it was a slightly suspect in the low G, whereas a hardy chanter, as you well know, could be suspect in the F. Yes. yes. But at the end of the day, the hardy chanter won the battle, mainly through the bands, of course. Aye. But the Robertson chanter was a good, good... Ronnie chanter. had the number chanters. Well, we went. Uh, he went to Hardy's and he got 16 chanters for the band. Uh-huh. And uh, they were all number issued to us, and mine was number 13. I had number 16. <laughs> number, <laughs> number 13 was mine. And that was the one I was lucky enough to win the gold medal with, which I still got it in here. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you were 13th on that day? 13th on, just after 11 o'clock, about, roughly about and 10 past Playing number 13 chanter. That's it, uh, yeah. uh, So don't let him tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Hey, your experiences in uh, the indoor competitions, uh, they played in the Highlanders Institute and they also played in the high school. Yep. Do you want to tell us a bit briefly about that? Well, uh, the main competitions at that time were the US and Scottish Pipers and the US and Barra in Glasgow. Uh -huh. But then they started ones in Edinburgh, there was Eagle Pipers uh -huh. and uh, the Edinburgh Police started one, they were later. Okay. And they were very successful. I think, if I remember correctly, the Edinburgh Police was the first to grade them. The, the large entry. Yeah. Are you right, Paul? I'm ready. Well, so. when, I, when I started playing in these competitions in Glasgow, the, 
they were held mainly in the Glasgow High School in Ellen Bank Street, and of course it was a lovely big auditorium, and there was still this sort of some of the good players still around, still competing, although he competed a long time after that, like Donald McPherson, Donald McLeod, and Peter McFarker, and they were all Brown and Nickel too used to come for them, mm -hmm. and of course it was a great big hall. And the used in Barra would start about t maybe 10 o'clock in the morning, and you'd still be playing the jigs at 11 o'clock at night. Oh, yeah. uh, the Scottish Pipers was successful, but that kind of dropped off for a wee bit, and then it started moving around, although it's still going, and yes. first later it's still going. Uh -huh. And as I said, the Edinburgh Police and the, brought in a competition on the Eagle Pipers. Now, as far as I can remember, the Eagle Pipers was the first to sort of grade, there was a B grade Peabrook. And uh, it made a big difference. They had a particularly the first prize in the A grade people, if you like to call. I don't know if it was called that at that time, but any the, the main people, they had this Watt Withersand medal, mm -hmm. and that was what was driving. The B grade was uh, quite a, a strong competition. There was people like myself who were slightly old, and then young people coming along who were making their name and doing quite. If I remember correctly, we Dougie Ferguson was one of the early ones to win that. Uh, Great. That BB, that B grade competition. That's interesting. Um, you know, it's a strange thing because that's I remember Ian McClellan playing the old sword and that, and people said he didn't play beaver, but my God, he played a great tune and he got a special prize that day. And uh, he mentioned that in his interview uh, that he played lament for, for the only son in the no, army competition. Yeah, oh, he did. I that was in the eye. Yeah, I think he got there. I think he got them from Andrew Pitt Keithley when aye. he was his pipe major at the time. Aye. But oh, he could play up mm -hmm. when he wanted. Just a, so, and, and a quick mention, Scottish Pipers Association, the Pipers Club, you were the chairman. Well, what, was, what was the format for the well, Pipers Club? The, Bob Reid was the president of the, of the piping, the Scottish Pipers for a long time. And when he eventually died, it was taken over by John McFadgen. But John McFadden was very time-consuming, and he gave it up after a while. I think John was about six or seven years, maybe more, as the president. And uh, Ronald Laurie took over for a couple of years, and eventually I took over from Ronnie. And I was over four, fourteen or fifteen years there as the president, right. and it was a great club. And I was fortunate enough to have a great committee, and I had two of the best and hardest working people. You. Flora McNeil and Dolly Mackay, oh, yeah. uh, they, they were a power of strength. And the committee itself, they would do anything for me. And we got very successful, and of course, we introduced things like the, the knockout. Although, funny enough, that was a College of Piping that started the knockout. Uh -huh. But it was used in the Scottish Papers. And uh, it's very successful. Very successful. The first and one then the was the uh, finalists, uh, Don McLeod and Duncan. Duncan Johnson and Duncan won. Uh, Aye. Oh, uh, and then the next next year was Ian McClellan, I think. And uh, Ian McLeod and Ian McClellan won it. Uh huh. And he was a great, great player that then. I mentioned about uh, Don McL uh, Duncan Johnson. Uh, he was a, a teacher, he didn't uh, compete. Uh... Duncan was one of these strange fellas. He, he loved playing, but he wasn't uh, keen on competing. And I can remember there was a programme, Seamus used to run a programme called Chanter. And I remember one of these programmes one night we were on it, and there was Duncan and I and uh, Seamus, and uh, Seamus says to Duncan, Duncan, you know that proper voice, Seamus, he was a very good, very educated man, but no matter what you think. Aye, aye. Seamus, you're one of our better pipers, but you don't compete. Why is it? Oh, Duncan says, I don't think MD plays at their best when they're competing. I don't enjoy competing. He says, I just uh, like playing. But surely, Seamus says, when you're up there competing, that's when you're at your best. No, he says, Duncan, he says, no, he says, when you're playing away at yourself in the kitchen and things are, that's when you're at your best. And Duncan says, and Seamus is not a tall, he says. When you're up on the platform and the adrenaline running, he says, that's when you're at your best, he says. Him. And he says, in fact, he says, you've, you've, Seamus says, you've never heard me in the kitchen. He says, no, I've heard you in the platform and that's bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> 
I must say, Seamus would took that very well when you would uh, repeat it. Oh, it's a good day, uh, good uh, chat. And I, another time I was on a programme with uh, uh, him and Roddy. Uh, uh -huh. No, not him, uh, Seamus rather, and Roddy. And uh, it was a programme about Pipers of the Past, uh, John. And there happened to be John MacDonald and, and John McDougall Gillis. Uh huh. Okay. And Seamus says to him, Roddy, you had lessons from John McDonald. I did, says Roddy. And you had lessons from uh, uh, John McDougall. Goes, yes, in Glasgow. I did, this is. And of course, she was in there like I shot. And is there any one tune you got from both of them? Yes, says Roddy. Mary's praise, the, one I, the tune I won both my medals with. Oh, says she was. And did you play it John McDonald's way when you won it? No. Nope. Oh, so you played it the. Uh, John McDougall Gillis his way? Nope. What do you do? He says, I played it the way the people decided. That's what won the bloody medal. He <laughs> <laughs> uh, was good as a... Uh, uh, Roddy was a very, very astute and knowledgeable man, you know. Uh -huh. And when I was in the, as president of the Scottish Pipers, I relied heavily on him for his guidance and he would be in the background there and he was great that way. So you had a, a, a very nice time over these years with the, the solo pipe. And well, right, and the Scottish, I, uh, and the Scottish, Scottish Piper. And of course, eventually I retired from the police and I, I, I was lucky enough to... Before you go there, I'm just going to drag you right back a wee second because I want a wee mention a uh, Strathclyde Police Pipe Band while we're in the 70s and 80s, you see. And... Uh, I, just, I must tell you, we've got interviews with Jimmy Wark, Ian McClellan, and Angus Laurie, and recovered uh, the subject quite well. But from a personal perspective, rather than a historical, uh, common perspective, what was your experiences with the Strathclyde Police Pipe Band this, uh, this, uh, under Ian McClellan? Excellent. Nothing but that. He was a tremendous pipe major. He knew exactly what he wanted and how to go about it. Many a time uh, people have asked me what was his real secret. And if I ha had to give one answer, it would be timing. He would arrive at a place and look at the weather and say, right, I want to start practicing seven, eight minutes past two. He meant seven, eight minutes, no, nearly two o'clock or nearly two quarter past. Mm -hmm. And you all blew in the same time and blew it and he worked up and worked up. Mm -hmm. And I can always remember one of one experience that drives us home. It was at Aberdeen, and we were going on in the World Championship. And the chap that was behind me had a kind of flattish top hand. Mm -hmm. and I was a wee bit worried. Anyways, we're coming up, and of course, you, you know yourself, you get surrounded by all these people around about you. I could hear, especially the Irish people, oh, the big machine's not going well today. <laughs> not at his best, there's a chanter out, you know. And I'm thinking, God, that's right. So anyway, we just got up, before we were due to go on, five minutes maybe, I was kind of, Ian says, right, give your two tones a wee touch. And I walked through one the road and he says, everything all right? I says, Ian, so and so behind me. Chanter's a wee bit flat on the top. Oh, I know, he says. And, and that's all he said. <laughs> oh, so, so we get lined up, played up to the park, we had a line of the park, and this was still flat. On we went into the park, lined up, and when we, st we struck up for the actual competition, this guy was absolutely spot on. Aye. And the whole way during the competition, and when we finished, Ian looked over and I went, oh, boy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And the thing was, he said, right, we'll play off and we'll play uh, the two polkas at that time, the Royal Scots and, and the Black uh -huh. And they played off, help my God, the guy was flat again. <laughs> so it was Mr. Adrenaline that was blowing. Oh, yeah. he, knew, he knew exactly <laughs> what he would do. <laughs> oh, he, he was terrific with that and Aye. terrific with a bagpipe. Yeah. Hey, he was also good at picking the tunes Aye. to suit. Yes. The members of the band, not just uh, the pipers, but the drummers. The drummers. Too. That's uh, very, very uh, important. Well, we were lucky during our time that we had um, two really excellent drummers in Alec Connell uh, and uh, John Kirkwood. Yeah. First of all, Alec Connell was a most musical man with it. Mm -hmm. But John Kirkwood, I don't know if people know, John was a superb piper, you know. Uh huh. 
I remember going to a summer school uh, and arriving in Canada, one Finlay McNeil and I, hearing this, and say, good God, who's that? You know, I had some playing that. And we walked in here, was a drumming instructor, John, John Kirkwood, playing the pig. <laughs> Amazing, eh? Oh, he was terrific. Aye. Yeah. But, uh, so, another th thing about Ian, I suppose that you're talking about a uh, timing as, as regards preparation, uh, but also his timing of a tune was pretty impeccable as well. He knew when to drive it on and where to drive it on, yeah. and he knew when to just pull it that bit back and uh, how to express it. Particularly in the marches and the real day, he was particularly good at that. So space, of course, we don't. You, there's not a lot you can do, although he got the best out of them and everybody in the band with him. Yeah. He was very strict on this four pulse dance rhythm in a suspe. Could you explain that? Well, the beat in a suspe is up. Mm -hmm. You know, if you play a march, the beat's down. Yeah. But when you play a suspe, the beats on the up on the bounce to keep the dancer to keep, near. Keep the dancer in the air. That's exactly what it is. Aye. And uh, uh, we had a wee bit of a laugh about dancing uh, the last time I spoke to you, where we both at some point or another in the old uh, Glasgow police band uh, were Highland dancers. Oh God, I. <laughs> it must have been some sight. It was uh, myself and Alan Hamilton, eh, yourself, I and. And Alan McPherson and Adam Anderson and Murder McDonald. Well, he, no, he was the king. Band he, he was the king of the dance team. The dance team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, a singer and uh, a dancer. Uh, 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 right. So, tell me about the, the World Pipe Band Championships. Uh, the, the first one. Uh, how, what was your experience uh, well, under Ian McClellan? You won under Ian McClellan. Uh, that would be six. The, no, yeah, it would be 70. No, no, it would be 73 or 74, maybe. I think just a wee bit later. No, I think. Well, no argue uh, about the year then. What, what happened there? What was your experience? It wasn't there? good. We didn't play the best. But in 76, he got the band to his way and uh, and we won the 76. I think that was in the hike, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. And that was a start, and there was no letting up. And you had the tattoo that night as well. We had the tattoo, we came back to Glasgow. Uh, we were played, we went on and played, and we couldn't wait mm -hmm. for the results because we had this tattoo. Mm -hmm. And uh, we came back to Glasgow, and our spot was due on, and we hadn't heard a thing. We left George Seymour, who was the drum major at that time, behind to see what was happening. Anyway, we went on. And we played, and as I remember correctly, we, 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 we got a fairly good reception as we always did, as you well know. Yeah. But then when we stopped, then we played off, and the announcement we must have made in, in his home, as some something like, ladies and gentlemen, you're now listening to the present world paper, and we heard this tremendous roar, uh, but no, no, still quite sure, till we came out the curtains, and there was George with the trophy, and all the, the Danish orchestra was there at that aye, time, aye. and they were all. Again. Oh God, that was some night. That. You had a wee shandy that night. Well, I, I mean, you, you're morally obliged, darling. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great stuff. You left the the band a wee bit of health in the, uh, the, the mid days, seventies. No, eighty six. Eighty six. Sorry, uh, sorry, eighty six. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, you went on to the College of Piping. Went to got, got the taken on at the College of Piping with Seamus and uh, that was an, an interesting experience too Aye. because there you were expected not just to, because you were a fairly good player to take good, you had to take everybody yeah. whether they were beginners or not and that soon brought you back Aye. but I was lucky there I got uh, Seamus was of course in charge and many a battle I had with him, you know, aye. but we got through it all right. Aye, aye. And uh, there were some really good players there, people too. Dougal McNeil was a stalwart of the, although he was mostly in Edinburgh then. Yes. But he was a, quite a stalwart. And then, uh, I think it must have been the early, late 80s, Angus MacDonald came to join us, Angus MacDonald, the, <laughs> the guards. Aye. That was just an education in its own. He, he was terrific. You'd be, in, the wind, in the summertime, you were busy and you would go work away. 
But in the winter time, I used to go in there early to get avoid the traffic and that. And I'd be sitting there in this wee room up. You know the room I was aye, at aye. And all of a sudden the door would burst open and you'd hear this, Hey, diddly dee, a paper's life for me. And Angus would come bursting up the stairs and bursting. Hey, 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 wait here, this wee tune of course, I'm away, I'm swayzy, this set of pipes I've just got here. <laughs> he was a fantastic guy and a great, great friend. Aye. A marvellous friend. Wonderful man, really. Yeah. You know? And, uh, you know, his lack of knowledge was... Uh, uh, he had no, I didn't mean to say that, his knowledge was very uh, full, full well, very aye. full. Aye. A great player, great oh, a all-rounder. Super player, aye. A super player. Aye. And, uh, and how did you, uh, uh, Seamus McNeil, did you ever hear him playing much? Yes, I heard him play. He was a very good March player, you know. Aye. I was not over impressed with his strips of and real playing. No. Very kind of staccato, if you like. Yeah. But he was a very, very good March player. And what about Peebrook? Well, he had his own ideas about Peebrook. He played, in, uh, eventually, in 1962, he won the medal playing Patrick Ogg. Uh-huh. But that was, uh, the, uh, that reminds me of an, uh, another story. At the Silver Chanter one year, and we were playing there, and uh, John McFadden was there, and Seamus was there, and... Uh, Ian McFadden said, you know, we're all playing here for ours for second, because our John's going to win it with that, with that bench, whether you like it or no. And Seamus says, no, Ian, correction. Your John's going to win it. I'm going to be second. You're all playing for the... <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened. That's what happened. That was in Vegan Castle. That was in Dunvegan Castle. Did you ever play there yourself? Aye, once. I played there once. How did you get on? A fourth thing I got, and it was. Uh, but did you enjoy the experience? Enjoyed the, I, I, I joined the experience, and I enjoyed it much better the time I judged. I judged the, the Silver Chanter with, with Willie the Mook, and that was a tremendous experience. I played, when I was very young, mm. at Dunvegan Castle in front of Dame Flora. Was that when you were at the school? McLeod, uh, the, the summer school at Dunvegan. And Evan Mackay was there. Aye. Yeah, he was a nice, uh, quiet chap as well, Evan. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. I, I played McLeod's rowing tune, was probably, that, probably that, very badly, but I, I enjoyed the experience. Uh, was that uh, the time Seamus got denounced from the pulpit in Sky? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be another one. Eh? <laughs> but for but a great atmosphere in the, yeah. the Vegan Castle. Uh, right, uh, great. Your teaching, and uh, uh, just a word on the the flow of uh, tunes and the, the, the theme notes and paper and that sort of thing. Well, I, I think it's all important. That when you set off in the, the, the ground and you portray this theme, and then you have to follow these notes through and make them uh, become, make sure that by the time you get through to the tour, the theme of that ground is still there, bringing them out. And, uh, and the big thing, of course, is the placing of cadences. Nowadays we don't we either place too many or we don't place them at all. But how you put put them in is not really terribly important as long as you do it consistently. Mm -hmm. There's uh, I don't like to hear this where they play it one way a long E in a short thing uh, in one line and then the next line they change it. Mm -hmm. To be a bit consistent, although that doesn't always necessarily happen. Yes. Um, right. Uh, there's a difficult uh, tune, the Kiss of the King's Hand, there's a wee bit of mucking about well, the cadences there. Uh, the bit. Kiss of the King's Hand's a, 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 a very good tune. Uh -huh. uh, but the only one I, place where I know there's really any kind of difference is in the third line where the, right. some people go up to the F and others stay down. Yeah, yeah. Um, summer schools with College of Piping. College of Piping and on my own in mm -hmm. many places. I was all over Canada and North America uh, for summer schools and uh, in Australia and Japan. Japan? I, oh, I had a tremendous experience in Japan with a uh -huh. summer school. But now Seamus sent me out there in his place and uh, it was really, really good. But they, of they course North they America they would be the place to be, yeah? North America was the place, uh, the trouble was the distance was still a long way to get to New Zealand. 
Mm. And we weren't going all, as much then, but there's they're now going there. Distance is nothing nowadays. Great. Uh, and what about online tuition and the uh, well, guys I'm, and guys uh, learning? Uh, peers and competing uh, well, in peer uh, competitions without a teacher? Well, uh, online I don't seem to worry too much because I think there is someone there again. Mm -hmm. But what I do worry about is those who pick up a tape and learn it from, or a cassette or whatever, a uh, CD and learn it from there. They don't get the personal nuances and the personal flow of the tune. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I get a wee bit concerned about that. I could well be wrong, but I think you still have to go to that for that personal touch, uh, just to get these wee bits of nuance and musical flow into the tune, mm -hmm. and the phrasing, get the phrasing completely correct. You see, one of the greatest assists we ever had in the pipe world, but I don't know if they use it so much now, was the books called Binnis's Borrowing. Yes. They were uh, written in phrases, as you well know. Unfortunately, there was a number of clerical mistakes and notational mistakes in them which didn't help but if you sort of got through that and uh, followed it it was they were great to guide you yeah, it's pretty accurate it was uh, they were very good uh, uh, I remember Ronnie Morrison told me he swore by that particular book yeah oh yes I would have to uh, uh, he liked that yeah um I think we covered the MSR expression, really, haven't we? Well, yeah, Marks and Spades and Reels is a very much a personal thing, although there is guidelines to be followed. Just, I, mean, I don't like to hear these... What sort of tempos do you like, the marches, when you're judging? So. I, like, I like them bright, Alan, but not not racing ahead like mad. You know, I like no. them. And there's certain tunes you, you can play that bit brisker than the others. Uh, I mean... Uh, one of the two, you know, the Highland Wedding, you can move that along in it. Uh, but uh, there's other tunes I don't like to hear them being pushed too hard. Okay. Um, and yeah. getting the flow from them. Right, I'm just going to wind up, in it, but I, I thought I'd wind up a very special place for you. Uh, Grant's competition, Glenn Fiddock. I don't know what, what's it called now. Uh, it's called the Glenn Fiddock. Glenn Fiddock. Uh, Tell the, the viewers a wee bit about that competition. They're looking from all over the world, so they need just a wee bit, uh, a, a sense of two historical background. Well, it, it was started in 1974, and uh, it was the, the idea of course, was you invited. I think the first one, or the first two, there was 12 papers invited in although only 11 played, that's another reason. But, and uh, they, brought, they got the, those who had won the sort of med, gold medals and that and brought them together and played. Uh, and it's been a great success since then. And uh, how did you qualify for it? You qualified by winning either the gold medal or the uh, Open and Inverness, the March, the Spain Reel, the, you know, the former winners. At one point, this a silver chanter. I don't know if that qualifies nowadays. Could well do. And then there was qualifications from overseas. They were qualifying by in America and that. And mm -hmm. that was a wee bit of a. I don't know if that's still going. Mm -hmm. But it might well. I think the first qual. See, I I remember writing an article in the Piping Times, and I said the the difference between the start. Uh, or the end of a piping year and the start of the new piping year is seven days and 500 miles. <laughs> and what I meant by that was the Glen Ferry finishes, and it will do this Saturday, uh -huh. 31st of October. The next Saturday is a London competition, which is 500 miles away and seven days later, and that's the first qualifier, the Bratter Gorham. My goodness, for the following year. For the following year. It's amazing, isn't it? So it's, a, it's quite a yeah. thing when you think about that. And you competed in that? I competed, competed in the Glenfiddich two or three times. Mm -hmm. Not with a great deal of success. But you enjoyed the experience? I enjoyed it and I, ju I judged it on a number of occasions. And, uh -huh. and I did my fair and tie there on a few occasions. So you, uh, and uh, you also pre uh, presented the Bilveni Medal. Uh, well, the Bilveni Medal. About the the, Bilveni Medal. The, 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 the Bilveni Medal was uh, struck by grants for someone who had done, in their opinion, a lot to for piping. For piping. And of course, people who went out. There was good players, and there was people. 
who you, you, you would really didn't, but they had done wonders for piping. There was a fellow called Duncan McClellan from Ben Bekula on it, just because what he had kept going in Ben Bekula. And Teaching. The Duke of uh, Arthur himself was awarded it, Bessie Brown, and then you had people like Bob Hardy. And I was fortunate enough, and I was lucky enough to get it uh, in 1999, I think it was, uh, for my teaching, if you like, in the college. And nobody was more surprised than me. And I remember sitting there that night, and I had my daughter Angela sitting beside me. And she knew all about it, because I hadn't a clue. And during the day, I could see people coming up and speaking to her. I'm saying to myself, I didn't know Angela, I knew them, you know, they were all coming up and talking. Anyway. Uh, we were sitting and John Wilson got up and he was rambling on about this. Uh, and I was looking at my notes thinking about the article I was going to do. And I said, and I said to Angela, who the hell's he talking about, Angela? She said, you, you clown. <laughs> <laughs> and I was lucky. And then I, I was lucky enough, I did a couple of the, present, the, the sort of presentation and the wee story for Ian McFadden, Duncan Johnson, and uh, Rose Fletcher. Now that Rose, was another yeah. one. That was another one. It was really a surprise. Aye, aye. And I remember building it up quite aye. nicely there. Oh, that the, went very well. I was there that day. That was excellent. Aye, and she, she just. Oh, uh, she loved that. She did. Aye. Aye. Oh well, there was nobody more deserving than, than that lady, oh, you know. Aye, aye. And her family. And she's yeah. done a wonderful interview for Peter's Persuasion as I've well. I've seen it. Aye, I've aye. seen it. Aye. So, Angus. We've well, had a great interview this evening, and the time has just flown by as usual. Alan, can I just uh, say to you and to Paul, at this stage of my life, and I'm not in the best of thing, it's been a great evening for me, and this talk has taken my mind off all these other things, and I'd like to thank both of you for allowing me the pr privilege of uh, doing it's, this. It's our privilege uh, for mm. uh, your for what it does, uh, your time, and indeed. Uh, It'll be great uh, education and entertainment for the viewers of the future, students, etc. And I hope that they pay uh, good attention to all your, the points that you've raised. About the, the, the well, plane, I'm quite you know. passionate about teaching, and yeah. uh, I think we really should be good. I think we, it's the, I remember Dr. Kenneth Mackay when they first established piping in the schools. We were at a dinner, the Scottish Pipers dinner, in the Highlanders Institute. And he stood up and he said, he introduced, he told us how this had happened in the first teacher. And he says, piping has become respectful again. Well, I would like to see that be getting more and higher with all the, it's really full-time teaching. Yeah. Although there is, of course, full-time teaching. Yeah, it's, it's going from strength to strength and the, the young piper nowadays is wonderful. Oh, I think so. And I think that the big difference between the, our time, maybe, Alan and our, they're, they're more musicians than we were. We were taught as pipers. Aye. They're now taught as musicians. Aye. Other uh, instruments as well. Uh, so I'm not uh, always 100% happy about some of their modern Aye. compositions, but then uh, that's life. That's, that's life. Uh, so, some of them are excellent, and they've got tremendous dexterity, some of these uh, players. Aye. You wonder where they get it from. Aye. Well, How much practice did you put in when you were young at that time? Well, as much as I could, Alan, although aye. I wasn't always allowed to. Aye, no. I remember being sent, for example, I would be getting chased out to the buyer if I wanted to practice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was lucky all the same that wherever I was, I had uh, my grandparents in Butte who had a croft and up north there was all... So I had plenty of places to practice. And, Angus, we're fin if we started in Butte and we're finishing in Butte. <laughs> All the best to you and thanks again. Thank you.